So we'll continue on this morning through the Gospel of John. We have covered the first chapter. We've gotten through John 1, uh, the prologue. Uh, John's, by the way, John's purpose is to present Jesus Christ in such a way that we would believe in him and find new eternal life in him. And so in chapter 1, the prologue, Jesus is presented as the creator God who came to us in the flesh. Nothing less than that. Then John the Baptist, the one who was sent by God to present him to us as the Son of God. And we talked about that concept and all that that implies. Today we come to an interesting passage, a passage that has caused some, some struggle, I guess, with Christians' understanding and uh, kind of clashes with some folk Christianity that we have. Uh, can you imagine that the first miracle Jesus accomplished was at a wedding uh, that was about to run out of wine, making enough really, really good wine for that party to go on weeks if they wanted to. And people have had some problems with that. What do you do with that? With a folk Christianity that says Christians don't drink at all, and yet you have this. And so you've, there's been some funny ways of handling this passage. Uh, there's been preachers that have preached that there are two different words in the Greek for fermented wine and unfermented wine, and this was unfermented wine. Some of you have heard those messages. And by the way, those people that presented them were probably very good preachers and men you admire and respect. The problem is we humans have a great capacity to, if we really, really want to find something badly, we have the ability to find it, even if it's not there. And that's what happened in, in those situations, because it's not true. This, this was fermented wine that we have here. And then there's others that, that said, well, yes, but wine was used as a water preservative. And what was called wine was really like 10 parts water to one part wine as a preservative. So this really wasn't wine at all. Again, not true. There's some truth in that one because it was used as a water purifier and it was watered down in its standard use. However, at a wedding is not when you're going to have the really weak stuff. It just was not culturally there at all. And so there's been a lot of those things that have happened. And let's just get this one out of the way from the start. So we just get this whole elephant out of the room and say this. The Bible is very, very clear on drunkenness, on inebriation. In the Old Testament, there is examples of disasters that were caused by that. Uh, Proverbs tells us that great warnings that wine is a mocker and that the dangers of strong drink. And in the New Testament, it's very, very clear. Do not be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Dissipation, by the way, is the opposite of edification. Edification is building up. Dissipation is draining out. So the Bible is, is crystal clear on drunkenness. You shouldn't do it. It's not good. Good things don't happen when you do that. However, those of you that believe every Christian should be totally abstaining cannot find a biblical argument for that. Now, culturally, we can make a good argument for why that is not an unwise decision. There would be some wisdom in total abstinence with the major problems we have in our culture today, and especially parents with children, best not to have that stuff in the house. I know, I was a kid that my parents had in the house, and me and my brothers knew exactly where they kept it. Yeah, it was way up on top, but we knew where stools were. Uh, so you can make a, a cultural case, a strong case, that there's some wisdom in total abstinence. However, you cannot make a biblical case. And it is, let's just face it, biblically it's not a sin to have a glass of wine with your meal or toast with champagne at a wedding, or have a cold beer on a hot afternoon. Okay, we'll get that one right out of the way. If you're having a problem with what I'm saying, your problem is cultural, not biblical. And why I say that, why it's important, for a matter of outreach, that can have an effect. If our message to people is, you don't do this and you don't do this, we limit our outreach greatly. Whereas, our, our job is to proclaim Christ to people. Let the Holy Spirit do what he wants with them once he gets a hold of them. But, so let's just get that one out of the way. Yes, it was wine at Cana, and yes, Jesus made that water into the best wine. With that in mind, let's read the passage. John chapter two. On the third day, now by the way, we know this is fairly early on because John so far is going in days. This is the first week in John's. If you go back, to, go back a page, uh, we have John the Baptist is introduced uh, after the prologue. 
And uh, then we see in verse 29 of chapter 1, the next day he saw Jesus coming and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And some of his disciples uh, took note of that. And then verse 35, And the next day John was standing with two of his disciples. He said, There's a Lamb of God. They followed him. Go down to verse 44. The next day he purposed to go to Galilee and found Philip. And then you go to... Uh, Act, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, on the third day, which is not necessarily the third day, which would be Tuesday. By the way, we know from rabbinic literature, weddings were held, if it was a first wedding, if it was a virgin, on Wednesdays, and if it was a widow remarrying on a Thursday. Why? We don't know, but that's in rabbinic literature. That's the day they got married. Wednesday was the wedding day, unless you were a widow remarrying, and then it was Thursday. And I, I don't know, there was a reason for that in their culture, but we don't know it. So it's not talking about Tuesday the third day. It's the third day after that. So this is the first week. We're still in the first week here. After this passage, then it's all up for grabs. And by the way, John is, is the, the least concerned with having things in order of all the, the Gospels. Luke is the most concerned. Luke says in his prologue, I'm seeking to write these things down in order. John goes all over the place because he's going thematically to present a Gospel track. But in these first uh, chapter and a half, he's, he's in the first week. It's one week there, so this is early on. So when it says he was there with his disciples, he had about five of them by then. Don't think the 12. He was just starting to collect those disciples. But at any rate, that's all background stuff. Chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not come yet. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And Jesus said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. And the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew. And the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. And we're going to stop right there at verse 11. An interesting thing, what, like I said, people have trouble with this passage. This, is, this has really nothing to do with my message, but I found it so fascinating I have to share it. Uh, in my study, I learned there, this, the liberal, very, very far liberal scholars do not believe in the supernatural. So they have to explain away all these things as they teach the Gospels, as myths and things like that. And there's one guy who, who is a, a, considered a scholar, well-known, writes commentaries, teaches in a seminary, uh, whose commentary on this passage was, he not believing in the supernatural, that here's what happened here. Jesus saw that this was a bad, bad thing, so he took some water and took it to the head waiter and said, wink, wink, taste this, wine. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And the head waiter caught the drift and said, ah, and said, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And he tasted and, and stood up and proclaimed, this man has saved the best wine until last. And thus the day was saved and the man who was about to be publicly shamed was now a hero. And that's what Jesus did, went around being nice to people. <laughs> and he added as a caveat, everyone was so drunk by then they didn't know it was water. So that was, that was how a quote unquote scholar who by the way teaches in seminaries, you know, we, we wonder why some of the mainline churches are making some of their decisions morally. It starts with their view of God's word. That's the bottom line. I just threw that in for comic relief because <laughs> that's actually out there. Yeah, it's, I'm, not, I'm not joking with that one. But here's what we really need to know. To understand this passage, we have to understand something about weddings in Judaism in the first century. Now, first of all, we know absolutely nothing about the actual wedding ceremony. We don't know the words they used. We don't know who was there, if there was a rabbi, if there was a Levite. We don't know anything. There's nothing, no indication, either in the Bible or in Jewish literature, that tells us what exactly happened at the ceremony. By the way, all of our wedding ceremonies are cultural. There's nothing biblical about a wedding ceremony. And by the way, it's, it's basically, that's part of what the gospel is. The gospel fits into any culture, and the gospel will adopt whatever wedding ceremony that culture does, as long as it's not ungodly. 
uh, and would, adu- would adapt that, and yet, the, you know, it'd be a, a Christian marriage yet, because that's what counts, uh, is the two becoming one. Uh, f- so we don't know anything about the ceremony, but we know quite a bit about the banquets. It, a, a, a Jewish wedding, you would start out with, a, with the groom going to meet the bride. The groom would be, groom would be spending all that uh, the time of preparation, getting his house ready and all those things. And the betrothal, by the way, was much stronger than our engagement. It was a binding contract to break off a betrothal. You had to divorce that person. That's why when Joseph and found out Mary was with child, he sought to put her away, divorce her privately. They were betrothed, but they would have to do that. So at any rate, they'd be waiting. That'd be preparation. The bride would be preparing. The bride's party would be waiting there. They would wait until dusk because it's a, it's a, it's a grand parade, and parades are much grander in dark by torchlight and lamplight. So they would go on this very special parade. The groom would come and get the bride, and all the wedding party would come. By the way, if you're thinking of parables that you may add some understanding to, that's the parable of the virgins waiting for the bridegroom to come. It's a parable of the second coming of Jesus, basically. And the groom was delayed and didn't get there till midnight, and they were all asleep and didn't have, didn't have any oil for their lamps for the lighted parade. So they weren't going to be a part. And then these people all went back by lighted parade, adding people as they went who were coming to where the feast, the banquet would be at the groom's house or some place they had arranged that maybe if their house was too small. And that's, that's how that would go, again, by, by torchlight. And then would be this lavish banquet. Now, here's where it gets interesting. What we know from first century times is that, and we know not from the Bible, but from actual uh, writings of early on, Jewish writings, a strange cultural thing. There was an idea in that culture of reciprocity when it came to wedding banquets. Now, what you must understand, the wedding banquet was the grandest banquet they knew. Those were the great parties, the wedding feast, the wedding banquet, okay? Now, you could actually sue somebody. If, if, if I gave a, a grand banquet and uh, just did it up with all the best food and the best wine and all these things, and then let's say uh, Don Rongren uh, had a son that got married and he didn't do a very good job. I could sue him for financial remuneration. <laughs> it's funny. This is serious. This was a cultural thing. You could sue somebody if their banquet did not measure up to the standards of your banquet that you invited them to. That's how huge these things were. You could, get, you could go into dramatic debt, because you could get sued by a whole bunch of people if you did an inferior party. So for that reason, these things were carefully done. All friends and relatives came to help. You borrowed money from whoever you'd borrow money from. You had servants. You had hired professionals to run it. That's called here head waiter. To make sure this was a bash to mash, match the other bashes, because it was, it was not just a, a societal shame. It could be financial problems if you didn't measure up. Now, none of you probably knew that. See, it, you say, well, that's weird. Well, every culture has their weird things. <laughs> you don't think we have weird things? Think of what we do with death. We drain out all the fluids of the body, put in preservatives, put makeup on, so like a wax museum replica of themselves, and put them in a fancy, expensive, and very, very comfortable box. They're dead, by the way. And then put that in a sealed cement vault because we don't want any of our dead to ever rot. Okay? Every culture has some weird stuff. If you you step outside of, oh, that's normal. No, that's really weird. (laughs) What they did with weddings and the reciprocity was really weird, but it's the way it was. Now, when you think of that, okay, think of something like another parable of Jesus, another one, because he used wedding banquets for many of of his second coming parables, Think of the wedding banquet where he invited all the friends and none of them came. They all found something else to do. Now, if you didn't come when you were invited to a wedding bash, because that was the the biggest parties they had, you either hated the guy's guts or you were afraid that it was going to be too nice and you would have to. So nobody was coming. And then the host said, okay then, Go out into the highways and byways and gather up anybody and everybody who come. People come to this banquet who would never have a chance of repaying, who would never have a chance of reciprocity. He said, that's the kingdom of God. We've all been invited to the most lavish banquet ever given without a chance 
of being worthy. Be begin to understand the parables when you understand. The and by the way, what is it called when Jesus comes again in the book of Revelation? Revelation 19, what do we call that? The wedding supper of the Lamb. We are the bride that is awaiting the bridegroom to come, and now we're going by procession to the wedding banquet of the Lamb, which is the greatest party that has ever been thrown in the history of humanity. So you begin to understand all this. Okay, so now take this back to Cana. We got this wedding. Mary was there, and we learn as we go along that Mary was probably either a relative or a friend who was helping out with this thing. And Jesus and his disciples, which is probably about five at that time, were invited. Verse 3, when the wine ran out. So, with what you now know, what's the significance of the wine running out? You are in major league trouble here. This party is about to go south. And not only would it be a social stigma, it could be financial ruin. I mean, this was serious business. So, Mary comes to Jesus. Now, think from a Mary knew, <laughs> but answer that, you know, that, that Christmas song, Mary, did you know? You know, every time I, I hear that, like, yes, she knew, okay? <laughs> Read the Bible. She knew. Luke tells us. Luke, Luke probably, by the way, interviewed Mary. Luke was the, the investigative reporter. He probably had an interview with the agent Mary and learned all that birth stuff, and Mary treasured these things in her heart. She knew what the shepherd said. She knew what happened as dedication. She uh, saw what happened when they went to the temple, and he was a young one and stayed back with the priests. And, and now she's watching that he has been identified as John the Baptist, and he's starting to gather disciples. And she knows this is a special kid, more than a kid. And so she goes to him, because this is a big deal, and she's helping out, and she goes, Jesus, the wine's gone. Now, what, what, there's no, nothing else said. That's all she does. She just says that. That's all she says to him. But what she's basically doing is, can you do something about this? What he says to her is one of the enigmatic things in Scripture that many people have struggled to understand. Here's what it says in this translation. He said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? Literally, it's what do you have to do with me? That's really what he says to her. Now, that sounds absolutely rude in our cultural context. Woman, what do you have to do with me? That's not, that, that's not what the way that's translated. It is literally woman, but it does not have the connotations if, if we said woman. It's, it could be the equivalent of saying my dear. So throw that one out of your mind. He's not going, woman. He's, think more like my dear. And then what he says, I believe, and this is, it's sort of enigmatic. No one knows for sure exactly what this is all about, except that we can put two and two together. He is really kind of making a break here. Okay, they're in a, a f familial relationship, mother and son. In that culture, until you got married, when you would leave your father and mother and cleave to your wife and become one flesh, you still had that bond. This is still mother going to a son, still had some authority over this guy. And what he's doing right here is he is breaking that authority on the basis of what he is about to begin doing and what he will eventually become. That's what he's doing here. He's basically saying, in a sense, you're no longer the one telling me what to do. There are greater things that I'm headed for, and you ain't seen nothing yet. And Mary gets it, because she then leaves him alone and goes to the servants who are helping and says, whatever he says, do it. So he wasn't, otherwise you have kind of a, a contradiction there. He, if, you, if he's saying, uh, don't bother me now, it's not time for me to start doing miracles yet, and then he does a miracle, that would be a little strange. What he's doing is he's making a break with her relationship as, in a sense, over him with saying, no, I'm, I'm on the road now to something far greater, and this aspect of our life is now done. And she gets it, because she knows he can do something, but she's not the one that's going to be asking him to do it, and he says, do whatever he says. And so then we get to what it really is, is the, the crux and the meaning of this first miracle, what he asks those servants to do is fill the six stone water pots for the Jewish custom of purification to the top. Now, those were washing pots, ceremonial washing. Jews would wash before every meal. It wasn't just cleanliness, it was the law. It was part of the regulations. They had to wash in the right way. By the way, that's one of the things that the Pharisees had against Jesus' of disciples when they were going out and they hated him, so they were trying to find any little thing they could. Said, oh, why don't your disciples wash like all good Jews do before they eat? Because they didn't always do that. 
You know, that was the very thing. So these pots were not empty. First of all, these were not pots where the first wine was, in case you have that idea in your head. No one would put wine in the purification water pots. They were there for ceremonial purification. Before these guests eat, they would go to those pots and they would wash before going. That's why they were there. So they weren't empty and they didn't have the previous wine in. So why does Jesus say, fill these pots to the top? They had water in them already. He could have just said, take some out of those. They wouldn't be empty because they're there for ceremonial washing. They weren't just sitting around waiting for the Passover or something. That was part of that, that big feast, a whole bunch of people, you had your pots for washing. So why did he have them fill those to the very brim? That is the million dollar question. And then we know the story. He takes them out, or he has the servants take some out, take it to the head waiter with no wink, wink, nudge, nudges. The head waiter takes it and drinks it and is astonished because he says, it's customary, you serve the worst wine later on after people have drunk freely, and you have saved the best until last. It is better wine than they started with. Now, one thing, it, by the way, this wine was almost certainly diluted. Uh, it, the, the pharisaical uh, kind of rules for that would be one part wine, three parts water is how you made what is the standard word for wine in the New Testament. So at these, at these weddings, you'd have to drink a lot to get drunk. It wasn't like people were sloppy drunk by the end, like that one commentator assumed they couldn't even tell water from wine. That, remember, the, and being inebriated was not good in that Jewish culture. That was not looked upon as, as favor. It's not like today in America, where getting drunk at a party is you know, so normal it's kind of disgusting. But uh, there it was that way. So a lot of times what would happen is the, the normal thing to do was, if you were running low, you'd start adding more water in, and that wine would be inferior because it was weaker. Although if you had some bad wine, you could throw that in, I suppose, too. But So uh, basically, what we have here is, is this being the very best wine. So what does all this mean, then? Th this is his, his first sign, according to John, by which he revealed his glory. What is it? Why the ceremonial water pots? When you think of it, it will come to you. He chose those pots because they represented the Jewish law, the, the Jewish uh, regulations that they had to go through. And by the way, this was, with those six pots full, it was uh, 120 to 180 gallons of wine. That's what we're talking about here. And uh, basically, when he changed that water to wine, he was changing the water of Jewish purification into the wine of the New Age. He was signifying something significantly different from those old regulations, uh, the burden of the law. And by the way, do you know what wine represents in Scripture symbolically? Joy. It's joy. The joy of the new wine in the kingdom of God with gladness. He is basically saying here, his first sign is, I'm going to change the burden of the law into the joy of the Holy Spirit of God. He is going to make transformation. It's the wine of the new age. And by the way, it was an abundance. He said, fill those to the very top. It was more wine than they would need if that, if that party went on for two more weeks. It was overflowing with abundance, way more than they needed. The wine of the new kingdom. God, when God blesses us, he blesses us abundantly. He has poured out his spirit upon us. He has lavished his grace upon us in Christ Jesus our Lord. Those are all scriptural words of how he has blessed us. This is his first sign identified. This is what I'm about to do. I'm about to transform this law that you keep having to come back to, keep washing and washing and washing. I am transforming that into eternal joy overflowing. By the way, next Sunday morning in this sermon, we'll be hearing about the new birth the brand new life, the transformation that he will make. The law burdens, Jesus transforms. This, the difference between those water pots and washing and the new wine they're transformed into is the same difference between the baptism of water of John and the baptism of the Spirit of Jesus. Not a baptism that says, oh, I need to repent and I need to keep repenting. It's a baptism that says, I am new in Christ. 
I have been transformed with the joy of the Lord. And all these things in abundance. That's why it says when it's done. It's very interesting the way it says this. It says uh, the, the man who had tasted the wine, the, the head waiter, he didn't know this happened, which throws out what that one guy said about you know, the little agreement between Jesus and, and the head waiter. However, those servants, they got it. They knew what happened. And verse 11 says, This is the beginning of the signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. They saw this. They saw what happened. This guy has power over the elements. He changed obvious water into the best wine. But what it represents is, is the reason why he chose those ceremonial pots to produce that new, overflowing, best wine. And when you add that to what you know about the, the wedding banquet, which is the illustration we have of the coming of our Lord and our joining with him forever, uh, I'll tell you, it is a significant miracle. He is, he's basically got it through to his, his mom now, okay? Things are going to be different from now on, Mary. And this is what's going to happen. And it begins that, that ministry of transformation, which is what he does and what he is all about. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks and praise for the new wine of the kingdom of God, for the joy that we have, that your very presence produces in us love and joy and peace and patience and all the rest of the fruit of the Spirit, that we are told in Scripture the joy of our Lord is our strength, and we can rejoice always, even in difficulties, because of this, because you have made all things new. We have been cleansed. We no longer have to go back to water for cleansing or rituals for cleansing. You have set us free by lavishing your spirit upon us. And so we, your new covenant people, give you worship and praise and thanks. And we thank you for this little episode from that wedding in Cana where you showed what you can do to set people free in your joy and in abundance. And we thank you and we praise you in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Praise team.